Well, Sibelius became a very important um, composer, both as a Finnish composer to the Finns, and after the beginning of the 20th century, a very important composer in the evolution of 20th century music. He rescued the symphonic form from the expansionist, late Romantic, Austro-German tradition that culminated in the, the works by Mahler and Mahler's uh, contemporaries, which were large, very large uh, structures, very large works in duration and ambition. Uh, Sibelius is important now for having written seven abstract symphonies, which increasingly developed a desire for compression, concision, and clarity. And these are all qualities that uh, both his contemporary composers and today's generation, many of today's generation, value. It's, this is not a competition between Mahler and Sibelius. They're both wonderful symphonists, but they both, um, they both developed in different ways from different sources. Uh, Mahler came from the tradition of German Romanticism, and Sibelius um, really evolved through, first of all, an admiration for Wagner, and then, and then the Russian school, particularly Tchaikovsky. But he cast them aside, and by the time he wrote the Third Symphony, he had left behind this sort of national Romanticism um, and embarked on a quest for a sort of classicism. And um, that led him to explore the last four symphonies, four, five, six, and seven, as almost unique statements of um, symphonic thought, which survive today. The symphonic form was getting out of hand, in a nutshell. So we have the examples of Strauss, Richard Strauss, Gustav Mahler, um, early Schoenberg, uh, writing very large-scale works, which they thought was appropriate, and they thought it was a natural development of the tradition that they inherited as young composers. Um, and I think Sibelius um, does offer an alternative route, a reaction against that, because the large-scale forms that these German, Austrian um, composers wrote, really did go out of fashion. Well, Sibelius was born into a Swedish-speaking family. Uh, his father died when Sibelius was two, leaving uh, huge debts for his widow and the, the, uh, the, the two children. She was pregnant with her third child when her husband died. But uh, Sibelius, therefore, was a Swedish-speaking Finn. He didn't learn Finnish until he was sent to a Finnish-speaking academy school at the age of six or seven, and he retained his affection and love of the Swedish language throughout his uh, life. In the 1920s onwards, if he got excited talking to his wife, I know, he would uh, lapse into Swedish um, because that was, that was his habit and he found a natural expression. His songs, of which there are over a hundred, almost all of them set to Swedish text because as a child, as a young man, he developed a very great fondness for uh, Swedish poetry. Sibelius grew up in a, in a middle-class family where music was reasonably important. There was a piano in the house, so he could become familiar with a piano and started playing the piano well, before he started playing the violin. Uh, he didn't particularly take to the piano. He didn't find it a very sympathetic instrument. And when his Uncle Pear presented him with the first of two violins that Uncle Pear gave him, Sibelius just fell in love with the violin. I and mean, he really didn't do formal violin lessons until he was 14. But he made rapid progress 
to the point when he went away to Music Academy in Helsinki, he he was capable of playing the Mendelssohn Violin Concerto, which is no mean feat. In between, he had developed uh, two things, a love of learning and playing the violin, but also a knack for writing music. And as there were three members in, three siblings, there was himself, his brother Christian, and his younger sister, Linda, all playing different instruments. They formed a piano trio. So by the time Sibelius was 15, 16, he was writing music for the immediate members of his family. And some of this music survives. Before he went to Helsinki, he really hadn't experienced orchestral music. He didn't therefore write for it. He didn't write for orchestra. And this takes us up to his three years under uh, Martin Begelius, the institute director. Martin Begelius was a Wagnerian. And um, Begelius was very keen for him to study abroad. Now, it was natural, it would have been natural, for Sibelius to have gone to St. Petersburg. Because after all, St. Petersburg was very close. There was a regular railway service between Helsinki and St. Petersburg. Finland was part of the... Uh, the Russian Empire, and it was St. Petersburg was a very important um, musical center. And so it would have been natural for Sibelius to have gone there, but Vigelius influenced him and said, no, you should go to Berlin, and he did go to Berlin. And it was in Berlin that he first heard two things, contemporary music and the most wonderful playing by orchestras. And this was a sea change in his attitude to uh, the power of music. When he came back from Berlin, became aware of Eino Janefeld, who became his wife. But then he went off to Vienna. This was a second year of, of, of hard work, studying under strict teachers. And it did Sibelius a lot of good. It developed his orchestral and awareness of writing for orchestra. And the upshot of this, of course, from Vienna was a discovery, really, of the Kalevala, and um, which also led to uh, the ability to express music in the Finnish language, because the Kalevala was written in Finnish, and uh, the uh, composition of his first great work for orchestra, uh, Kulovo, known as a symphonic poem. But... Um, could also be regarded as a symphony or indeed as a cantata symphony, as the early choral works by Mahler, Das Klagen der Lied and such like, are very similar sort of outline of similar ambition. Well, uh, Sibelius uh, adored the violin, but he never became a true virtuoso. We have to understand that. He started too late. Sibelius really began lessons at 14. Sibelius had terrible stage nerves. And this, of course, is, is fatal if you're a violinist, a soloist. He came to realize that his metier was not going to be as a, a violin virtuoso. His metier was as a composer uh, of uh, increasing genius. And you've only got to hear these early orchestral pieces to understand the astonishing individuality of the sound of the music. He was uh, friendly with a very good violinist, Willy Burmester, who he would have met in Vienna um, in the 1890s. Willy Burmester was a virtuoso. He was also the leader of the Robert Kajanus Orchestra in Helsinki up until about 1895. So Sibelius knew Burmester very well and was... Uh, uh, an admirer of his playing. He did announce the dedication of his new violin concerto to Burmester, and Burmester was obviously delighted and was looking forward to performing it. And Sibelius was busy writing this concerto, causing him no end of trauma, staying up at night, um, composing at night, which he did at various stressful times of his life, right through to the Seventh Symphony. He was uh, under severe financial pressure. He was approaching the need to pay bills to move to Ainola. Um, he was never a good person with money. He was always in debt. Burmester 
was a busy man and said he could play it in March, I think in March, in um, in Helsinki. This was not soon enough for Sibelius. Sibelius needed a concert with a big premiere earlier than that to revive his financial fortunes. So he entrusted it to a second-rate violinist, a professor at the at the academy, the the uh, the uh, institute in Helsinki, a man called Novacek. And this was a terrible mistake because uh, the premiere took place in uh, early that year, 19, 1904. And Novacek was not up to this virtuoso material at all. He, was, he kept saying to Burmester in writing, don't worry, Herr um, Burmester, uh, this is your work. Um, you will you will um, give the premiere in in Central Europe in Berlin, where where it deserves to be heard. Um, then withdrew it. Uh, Burmester saw the score. Sibelius had to write to him saying, "May I have my score back, please?" Because the Sibelius decided that it wasn't adequate. He withdrew it, and and Burmester was suddenly left without a premiere. Um, and he announced in correspondence that he was going to uh, wait at least a couple of years before he revisited and reworked the concerto. It was a little bit within that period that he did um, because there was um, the possibility through his publisher, Robert Lienau, in in Berlin, that they were pressing him for a for, for big orchestral music and uh, they were aware that there was a violin concerto. Um, and they were they were suggesting very strongly that Sibelius gave the German premiere in 1905, uh, and Sibelius set immediately to revising it. He did it in six weeks, which anybody familiar with the first and the final versions is an astonishing short period of reworking from the first version to the to the final version. Baumeister was wanting to obviously perform it in Berlin. But his publisher had other ideas. They'd got Richard Strauss to, lined up to conduct it. Wow, that's quite a story. That's quite something for the emerging talent of the Finnish composer into, um, into the uh, European mainstream. And it didn't allow Burmester to take part. And also, Burmester wasn't available on the date. So that was entrusted to Karl Hallier, who was the leader of the Berlin Orchestra that Strauss was the... Uh, the conductor of, uh, presumably, the Berlin Philharmonic. And this was the final straw for poor Burmester. Um, he had been, uh, he had had the promise of a dedication. He had been promised um, a premiere on each occasion, and he got none of that. And he, he was very upset, and he said, I will never play this concerto and he never did. Lots of people are, are very happy to um, connect Sibelius with descriptions of nature and so on. I don't do that. I see Ab Sibelius largely as an abstract composer, but I absolutely understand why some people do. Uh, I suppose if you listen carefully to the concerto, you will find examples of all those descriptive elements. And, and, and uh, that, again, uh, probably accounts for his popularity from the wonderful opening. Probably the finest opening of any violin concerto, the most poetic, to the, um, the extreme virtuosity that we hear the soloist play in the cadenza, which is, which is just astonishing. Through to elements, elements throughout the the, uh, the concerto, the warmly romantic sound of the opening of the slow movement,
the entrance of the Solo Valens, singing a long song. Long, long cantilena, uh, which is immediately memorable, um, with a, a sort of impassioned middle. And then we come to the finale. Well, the Polonaise for polar bears, but it's also a dance macabre, and it never relents. It's just it's an astonishingly difficult work for the soloist. Typical Sibelius trait is off end opening a bar off the beat. It takes getting used to, both for the players in the orchestra and for the conductor. It shouldn't sound difficult. It should sound effortless, but you should be aware that it's not easy. In other words, the virtuosity should should overcome the difficulty for the listener to just sit back and enjoy it. But easier said than done if you're the soloist. Mm-hmm. 